Hi, I'm Carol Cusack. I'm Director of Primary Care at Wessex LMCs. And I'm Nigel Watson. I'm the Chief Executive of Wessex LMCs. So this is the second of three podcasts that Nigel and I are doing on primary care networks. And this one is about who's a partner in a, pra- uh, a PCN and what it means for practices. So first of all, I want to ask Nigel, actually, who are the partners in a primary care network? So you nearly said, who are the partners in a practice? I did. <laughs> Um, So we'll come back to that. Um, But who are the partners? So the core members of a primary care network are the practices that form that geographical footprint. Um, The whole reason it's set up like that is so there is an ownership of the network as the practice embedded in the community and that accountability, responsibility to the community. But the expectation is that this isn't just about new money coming in to buy new staff that work in the network for the practices, that the expectation is that there will be other partners. And if you talk about integrated care, Mm -hmm. um, bringing in community nursing on the geographical footprint, but really embedded in practices using the same clinical record, working with practices in a single team in a seamless way, getting rid of a lot of the organisational barriers we have at the moment. Also, um, working with mental health, the expectation is community mental health teams, again, should be on that geographical footprint working with practices. And I would hope as time goes on and we invest more in mental health, which is clearly an important area, that resource will mean that that will help GPs and practices with their workload. Also, the local authorities are uh, in the past have found it quite difficult to work with individual practices where everybody wants something different. But actually working in populations of 30 to 50,000 and working together, that makes it a much more attractive prop, uh, proposition for um, the local authorities to work with. Also, um, the voluntary sector, we've had a number of emerging PCNs in our area where the voluntary organisations are already coming to them to say, how can we work with you? And with the new staff groups coming down, so social prescribers, for example, the expectation is that they'll work for practices but be embedded in um, the community and actually work where where the voluntary organisations are to work with them. So that, you know, the idea, again, is all about reducing the workload for practices to make it much more sustainable. And to some extent, looking at alternatives to a traditional medical model for some of the things that don't need to come into the surgery. I mean, that sounds like a huge piece of work. And I know practices, some individual practices have managed to forge relationships with social services and voluntary sectors. So do you see this as a PCN-led type of role? I do, but, um, you know, each individual PCN is not going to be able to go to the community provider and ask for something completely different. Mm -hmm. So I think that's the role of the LMC working with the commissioners, um, which we're doing at the moment, talking to the community providers, trying to look at what is the model that works? So, again, you know, I'll go back to the partnership review. If we want to help practice workload, I think we need more GPs, so we need to make general practice a better place to work. We need more staff um, delivering direct patient care, so the clinical pharmacist and later on the first point of contact physiotherapist, mm-hmm. etc., will help with that. And the third bit is making more efficient use of existing staff that work in the community. So I believe that the community nurses need to not only be based geographically, but accountable to the network and be part of that network leadership so that we make more efficient use. We end the referring to a community team. Actually, they're part of our team and work with it in 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 what I would describe as an integrated way. So you're right. If you stand back and say, these are all the things we want to do, that sounds a huge piece of work. Some of that is about relationship building and will take some time. Some of it is about what is the benefit for both organisations to be able to evolve and develop that. And some of those things are already happening in some of our areas. Yeah. Um, back to basics now. Do all practices have a right to join a PCN? Um, the, it's, a, it's a really interesting question mm-hmm. because the intention is that by the end of June, everywhere in England will be covered geographically by a primary care network so um, most of our practices have already established their relationships and who will be members of their PCN hopefully there won't be um, many practices who don't naturally fit and for some of those who don't naturally fit there's obviously local negotiations going on Um, you can't leave a practice out so if by the end of 
uh, May, a practice is not in a network, then that what the guidance says is the LMC and CCGs will work together and a practice might get allocated. That's not an ideal situation. No. And hopefully um, by the end of this month, uh, they, they'll all have been sorted out. OK. What if a practice doesn't want to join a PCN? So practices do have the right. There are um, incentives there to be a member of a network. So the £1.76 that comes directly to practice to participate. But if they don't want to, um, they have a right. It's a directed enhanced service. Mm. It's an option. Um, I don't think there'll be many practices that won't, particularly in year one, where what you have to do for the resource that's coming is not um, excessive. Yeah. Um, but if they don't want to, that's their option. The pound fifty will still come to the primary care network for that practices population. They will still get the reimbursement for staff to the same level and the expectation is that they will deliver services for the whole of the population including the non-participating practice. I think what we need to make, make clear is it isn't that they will be delivering basic GMS services for no. that practice but if you for example develop a frailty service or you know where we've got some paediatric hubs then that practice won't be excluded but they won't get all the benefits of the primary care network. It's hard to see how a network would fund a pharmacist, for example, and then embed them in that single practice um, mm. when they're not participating in the network. So, you know, there may be one or two practices who, who won't sign up immediately. I hope most will look at the benefits um, and the risks and work out that the benefits are better than the risks. But it is for each practice to make that decision. And can I just clarify then, so because extended opening hours are part of that DES, if a practice is not in a PCN, it will be up to the PCN to provide the extended opening hours for that practice? It will. It's, it, will. It's, yeah. um, it is a PCN requirement. Right. OK, fine. What if a practice joins a PCN and then realises that they've got more in common with the one next door or something like that? Can they change? They can. Um, we have tried to encourage practices to look at the medium to long term rather than try and game the system in mm. uh, early on. There is, in the, in the guidance, there are ways in which you can change your primary care network, but it will, you'll need to go to the commissioners and get the commissioner's permission to do that. The bit I would say is once you establish your primary care network, you have a geographical boundary. You start aligning services, whether they're from the local authority, community nurses, and you build it around that network. It is not just about the practices. Yeah, so if yeah. a practice moves the network, you're looking to change a significant amount of stuff. So I would hope that um, we get the networks right, we make them work for practices. The other bit you can do um, is, for example, if you're a large practice, um, you may be geographically based and be your own network, but some may sit in two networks, mm -hmm. and you could be a practice member of one network and be a partner in another. Right. So if you've got populations that span geographical basis, you can work in a a flexible way and I think flexibility is the issue here we need to make sure this works for our patients and our population but also for practices so what you're saying is you can only be in one network but you can you can be in two networks it's right. not ideal because you'll you know split your resources split your time doing yeah. it but you know some people have called it being an associate partner uh -huh. so if you sit within a another geographical basis you may want to work with that network and put some resources into that okay now, we are hearing of some practices that, that um, are forming PCNs that cross CCG boundaries. Is that going to be possible? It is. I mean, the, generally, clinical commissioning groups were established in uh, a way that was geographically um, seen as being reasonable in terms of patient flows and, and not so much about practices. But, it, but there are some practices, particularly with merged practices, that cross boundaries. So what you need to look at is it's not just about practices, it's about what's that community, yeah. where does that community identify themselves, because this is about building up services within the community uh, to benefit the health of that community, which you know we would believe that practices are absolutely fundamental to. So um, you, know, you and I have uh, been around one or two years and seen um, organisational change where we've had health commissions, health authorities, primary care groups, primary care trusts, and now 
CCGs and some of the CCGs are working in bigger units. Yeah. So we shouldn't be seeing boundaries as a barrier. Yeah. Um, what we should be looking at is how do we make this work? There will be some difficulties working across county boundaries or local authority boundaries where you might need to work with two mm. um, local authorities. But that is possible. But I think the the justification for doing it has to be a valid justification not just well we want to do it because we want to do it Um, I think CCGs might find that slightly difficult but that's where again the LNC needs to work with practices and the CCG to look at what's overall in the best interests of practices population other organizations okay thank you um we're not going to say much more on this podcast other than Nigel's going to mention something about some seminars we're going to be doing and the next one we're going to be talking about federations, alliances, how they fit in and about VAT and those sticky issues. Thank you. Do you want to just mention something? Yeah, we're getting lots of questions as the accountants and lawyers are about the financial and legal aspects of networks, about VAT, taxation, pensions, risk, um, and how you establish a network to ensure that there's fairness and equity. So there's a plethora of guidance out there, some of which is um, really helpful, some of which um, practices and networks have lots of questions about what that means to them, you know, whether they're dispensing, whether they're VAT registered or not, etc. So what we're doing, working with our specialist medical accountants and medical lawyers, we are putting on a series of seminars, uh, inviting primary care networks to come to that and try and work through the concerns and issues they have so that in year one which we want to establish things keep things simple and allow the evolution so we can get to that stage where people feel we've mitigated the risk there's enough information to be able to do what they need to do and we'll be announcing those shortly okay great thanks nigel thank you very much we'll be back